because I'm the senior director of Collective Impact. Thank you, Chloe, of Collective Impact here at Workforce Central, your local your Pierce County, uh, your local Pierce County Workforce Board. We have oversight over Pierce County, and I have the honor of being um, uh, given the opportunity to kick this meeting off, facilitate um, the activities in this with Tamar Jackson and Kelly Brickhouse and Chloe to really get um, to the meat of the matter when we have these bi-monthly Pierce County Community Engagement Task Force meetings, and we are so excited that you are here. Now, now that everyone's done introductions, I'm going to just take a little bit of my privilege as the facilitator, and I'm going to ask you, what is something that what are what are what is something that happens in your mood with the sun being out? Like, what is something that you're doing? You know, with the sun shining, how does how has it shifted your mood? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Let us know. You know, what is it that you're doing? The sun's shining. It's the Pacific Northwest. Y'all know we on the time clock with this here sun, so don't we don't have time to waste. Share with us some things that you're doing or how it's changed your mood. Um, and, and, uh, those are just, it's just a little, little quick icebreaker that I'm taking in my moment of privilege. We're going to go ahead and kick it off while you're firing up the chat. Chloe, I'll have you read the, um, land acknowledgement, and then we'll shift from there to, from Chloe to Tamar to welcome you all in and talk about what he needs to talk about before we shift to updates. Yeah, of course. So, um, for our land acknowledgement, we just want to take a moment for, well, we're all meeting in different spaces throughout Pierce County and uh, virtually, so um, we all just want to take a moment to recognize uh, the space that you are currently on um, and to to recognize that for us, Pierce County being on land of the Puyallup people um, and wherever you find yourself today, wherever you're located, um, to take a moment to um, acknowledge that and reflect on that and um, uh, be thankful and grateful for that. All right, thank you, thank you, Tamar. Man, what's going on, everybody? Look, like th this heat's killing me outside the house, not inside, but outside the house. But you know what I'm saying that AC hit a little different. I'm not gonna lie to y'all; it, 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 it's it's very different. Um, Shelly, to talk about what you do, I I think I get angry when it's too damn hot. I ain't gonna lie to you. Like I get mean when it's hot. You know what I mean? Like you got people in the store want to bump up against you and. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you got to hit the extra sometimes because, you know, them aisles get a little muggy when it's hot and everything. You know, there was a lady in there. She was in there for two hours just to stay cool. I think she had three items in her basket, but it was a smart move. She sat right by the freezer aisle. So, you know, big ups to her for finding her cool. But I think me, I just get angry. I get irritated when I'm hot. It just, you know, leave me alone. Don't call. Don't talk. I don't want a meeting. You know what I mean? My, my, my computer get mad. Didn't even log on. It was just like, you know what? It's too hot for all this. So, you know what? We just going to skip it and chill and do what we do but uh everybody man welcome 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 i hope you guys all enjoyed your fourth of july weekend um finally getting back you know i was off for three weeks going to go get married and everything else so it was actually amazing and having a great time with the squad that was with me in cabo but um excited to be back i don't know for many of you whoever is your first time welcome um, over the years, we've really transitioned to many different subjects, many different topics. And as we came in this year, um, Kelly, Chloe, myself, um, and the rest of the team, Shelly, we figured that we wanted to be more intentional with many of our conversations that we were going to be having with you guys. I think that we have a platform to really talk the talk. Oh, excuse me, really talk the talk and talk about the things that I think a lot of people don't really like talking about. You know, we um, as service providers, we talk about um, apprenticeships. Where's the connection in apprenticeships? You know, so we had a lot of people um, on a panel a few weeks back. That was absolutely incredible. We got a lot of resources for those that are in the apprenticeship space. Uh, we talked about the community reinvestment fund. A lot of us didn't know about it, but we brought the professionals to come and talk about it. One that was really close to Kelly's heart is juvenile reentry. I know a lot of you guys deal with young adults and the, the services around them with homelessness and stuff like that. So we wanted to bring in professionals to talk about what we're doing around reentry, how we can better support. You know, I think a lot of people always said, you know, as we all grew up, you know, you do the crime, you do the time. The problem is, is when they're coming out after doing the time, they're still treated as they're continuously doing the crime. So how do we better support those individuals as they're coming back into our community? How do we bring the resources to them? How do we welcome them back to our community and 
feeling as a community member. And I think that's what us just being more knowledgeable around the resources and supports that we have in community, who's doing them best. And if you're the best one doing them, you're the one that we want to highlight. You're the one that we want to go to. We don't want to reinvent the wheel and act like we know something that we do not know. If you're the best at it, we want to reach, connect out with you. So throughout the day, when we're talking to the panelists, that would be something Kelly takes on. Reach out to those individuals, make a better connection to those individuals, get to know them, whether that's going to go have coffee, have lunch, whatever it is. I think a lot of us, we serve better when we are directly connected to each other, not through emails, through a phone call, whatever that looks like. The better we know each other, the better we can serve community. And with that, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Kells and let her do her thing with the um, updates and, and we're going to get rolling. Yeah, and you got to update, too. So, um. Good morning, everybody. I don't know about y'all, but the sun does not allow me to go to sleep until like the heat, you know what I'm saying? Until like two in the morning. So I feel like I've only slept a couple hours. Um, so make sure everybody take a nap if you can after this meeting. <laughs> get that, get that sleep back. Um, anyways, updates. So wow, what a summer. It seems like it's going by so fast already. Um, the only thing we need, well, there's a few things going on. So on August 24th, we are doing a collaboration for a cause in Key Peninsula. We only have about 13 tables. So if you or your organization is interested in joining me out in Key Pen, uh, please reach out to me directly. You can also throw it in the chat and we'll capture that today and I'll reach back out to you. So it is August 24th. It's in Vaughn. That is a Saturday. Um, it's in uh, where, you know, we paired events again. So they do this huge community like uh, clothing giveaway. So we're looking at like three to 400 people coming out, which is huge. Um, and we want to be there to offer opportunities, resources, and so on. So again, if you're interested, please reach out and I'll send you the rest of the information we're working on right now. Um, there is a ton of events coming up in our local community here. I know the East Side celebration is coming, um, so many. So make sure y'all get involved and take part in as many of those as you can, because I, I believe we have a lot of community members coming out. And the best way for us to get out information is, of course, to show up at events. So keep doing that for sure. Um, that is, is that my only update tomorrow was like, that was, that was the one we've been gone for a hot minute. I've been gone for a hot minute with some family stuff going on. So this is what my, my, my third day back or something after a month and a half. So still trying to do a lot of catch up. So if you emailed me and I haven't emailed you back, sorry, email me again. <laughs> so. No, and also, uh, we got a big update though because we wanted to do something fun with the task force. Not we didn't well, want to. You got to hold off. You, you know what? You you too excited to be talking to the people. You need I to hold excited. off, man. I am excited. You, you need to hold off. You 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 giving up too much at one time. Hold off. But I'm gonna start it with February twentieth. Be aware. We locking it down. The lens of equity 2025 is coming. We have waited for a minute. We wanted to go bigger. We wanted to go stronger. We know that this year is going to be a little bit crazy. That's why we pushed it into 2025. So it didn't get washed away with everything else happening in the world. But keep an eye out because it is coming. So all them businesses that have been waiting for their budgets to be able to sit and put that ticket in there, understand it. Throw it in your budget. The lens of equity 2025 is coming. Look, that's the real deal, too. So we are going to be at the Tacoma Convention Center this year, which is amazing. We want to get people not only from Pierce County in the lens of equity, but we're looking to go statewide. And in some cases, we have people traveling from out of state. But this is a big year, y'all. This is a big year. The end of this year is going to be crazy. And coming up on February, we're going to have a lot of stuff to talk about. So that that is real. If your business or your organization can help support this event, let's do that. Let's make it big. And uh, definitely let's really, let's really, really, really dive into what's going on and have some great speakers out there, but we definitely need your support. I think I said it like I took what you said tomorrow and I kind of elevated it a little bit. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. I'm not, I'm, I'm y'all are too. You funny. know what? <laughs> well, we talk about, talk about speakers, talk about something else. Cause you know what? <laughs> She's been gone too long. This heat messing with her. I'm going to deal with her later, y'all. Chloe, <laughs> please speak on the Speakers Bureau for me. Chloe, just, just... go ahead and give us any more updates. And then once you're done, Chloe, we're going to shift back to Kelly so we can get into this presentation today where we are talking about reentry um, in, in all of the 
all of the opportunities um, associated with that. And, and uh, we have some great speakers coming before you today. So once Chloe finishes, Kelly, you take it and let's get it. Let's kick this off. Yeah, so um, that's pretty much covered everything. The only other update I have to add is um, for our speakers bureau. Um, we're in the process of revamping that um, to help um, have a group to come together that's really focused on um, civic engagement people who have lived experiences to um, share that um, at, at multiple different levels. We're um, putting that together. So we have our next meeting in person on, um, it's later this month, I believe on Tuesday, um, July 23rd. Um, so if anybody's interested in learning more about that, um, I'll put our uh, email in the chat, our task force email, um, where you can reach out and get more information on the Speakers Bureau, um, our collaboration for cause events, or if you want to learn more about the Lens of Equity Summit and what it would look like to support that, um, I'll put that email in the chat for any any questions you have about any of this. Um, it's a, a good starting point to reach out to, to that email or to, to any one of us. So um, yeah, that's that's all I have on updates. Okay, I'll do your thing. Okay, perfect. All right, well, we'll jump right in. Um, let's. Is Marcos <laughs> is Marcos online right now? I would like to introduce our panelists. Let's. I want to make sure that everybody else is muted. Um, on the meeting, we will. We want to make this a great conversation, y'all. So we're talking about reentry today. We have four amazing panelists on here who are very just submerged in this work right now, which is great. But as with every task force meeting, we want to make this a really good conversation. So we have some pretty general questions to get it going on. And then we'll get a, a little deeper into some other questions, but please throw your questions in the chat. Um, again, you have experts in this field on there. So ask away. This is how we're going to identify some of the gaps. We're going to learn from our community and we're going to make these initiatives uh, better and we can also better work together. So if I could have, let's see here, we'll start with some introductions. Um, Sherry, let's hey, start with- Kelly, you. real quick, um, everybody else outside of the panelists, if you could turn your camera off, it makes it easier for you to follow yeah. the conversation and just change your view to who has um, uh, uh, their picture on. So if you ain't speaking, go ahead and turn your camera off. And um, yeah, my apologies, I meant to say that earlier, but go ahead, Jels. Where'd Dom go? Why did Dom turn his camera off? Dom, you're on, you're a panelist. <laughs> like, come on back. <laughs> All right, cool. If y'all want to just start with introductions, uh, Sherry, we'll go Sherry, Dom, Brian, if that's okay. Awesome. Uh, Dom always has his camera off, by the way. He's kind of like me in that regard. So, Dom, it's so good to see your face. You too, Sherry. <laughs> yes, Brian. Brian is my colleague here at Vallejo, so I see his face pretty regularly, but good to see you as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Sherry Jensen. I'm the CEO and founder of Vallejo Vocation. Vallejo is a workforce development organization. Oh, hold on. Can we just comment on my background because we're talking about summer and I've got a fort built back here because my kids coming to work with me. And so it's it's a mess in here, but uh, so Vallejo was founded in 2018 as a workforce development organization that has a staffing arm. We prioritize individuals experiencing homelessness using employment as a tool. And pretty early on, we recognized that one of the symptoms that folks experiencing homelessness experience is criminal justice impact. And so if we're to be become experts in helping individuals end homelessness using employment as a tool, we recognize that we had to also become experts in understanding the criminal justice system and the impact on the folks we serve. And so uh, two years ago, I believe, Dom, maybe it's been three years, Dom and I started having conversations at the District Court Resource Center about how we can develop programming to fit the mission of Vallejo and to serve people in the best, most intentional way possible. So that was a long introduction. Sorry about my four in the background. I'm gonna pass it on. Great to be here, everybody. I think it's Brian's next, right? Yeah, uh, I'll go my turn. Um, so yes, my name is Brian. I also 
I uh, work here at Vallejo with Sherry. I am the program manager of both our Transitional Employment Pathway Program, which is serves our uh, homeless community, but also our pre-trial Pathways Program, which is our re-entry service that we offer uh, in partnership with District Court, um, specifically working with Dom. Yep. Who, who am I next? Yep. All right. Uh, Brian and Sherry already said it. Uh, I I am Dom Hardman with the Pierce County District Court Resource Center, and been working with Sherry for a number of years uh, with the Work Crew Plus program. That's grown with uh, the work of Brian and Vallejo, and we'll probably get into that a little bit uh, today. Um, but yeah, Resource Center provides wraparound services for justice involved individuals and the pathways program that uh, I'm sure we're going to we're going to discuss uh, again kind of expands that notion of helping uh, justice involved individuals. I love that. Well, thank you um, all three of you for being here today. So the criminal justice system is absolutely I think many of you know, even my own personal story, which is very, very long and layered like an onion. But the criminal justice system has certainly impacted me. Um, and in years and years ago, going into um, trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up, which I probably didn't grow up until I was about like 30. Norman would probably say 40, but um, definitely something that's impacted me. Um, so I think this is so important to talk about because so many people that we do run into today um, have a criminal background and oftentimes feel so lost in what to do or think that they can't get into anything or have a progressive wage job. So we're going to dive right into questions. And I do believe, Dom, I'm starting with you. Um, as we go through these questions, y'all feel free to chime in um, on whatever you want to. Or if you don't you know, have to answer that particular question, don't. And we'll move along. I do want to save a good amount of time for our the rest of our task force to ask questions as well, because I think they're going to have some things that we probably didn't think about asking. Sound good? So Dom, this first one is absolutely for you. So obviously we've talked about, uh, you know, barriers with justice involved individuals. So can you talk about what are the most significant barriers and how do these like really differ between those released from jail versus prison? Oh, okay. Um, you know, I, I, when I talk to folks about, you know, somebody releasing from prison, obviously, if you're releasing from prison, you, you've you committed a, a felony offense. And normally, if you're releasing from jail, it's probably going to be a, a, a lesser offense, a misdemeanor offense. The, the problem is you're going to have the same needs. So I may serve just enough time in the local jail, which, again, you're not going to you usually don't spend more than a year in jail. Uh, but the time I spend in jail can be just long enough for me to use, use, lose everything that I've achieved. So my housing, my employment, um, my family connections, just enough time for me to lose all of that. And the problem with the jail is there's no programming in the jails. There's, there's no counselor that's working with you on a transition plan. Um, you're really left on your own. And if you're new to the criminal justice system, it can it can be a nightmare in trying to navigate the available services. Um, again, there isn't there there isn't a counselor in a jail that's assigned to work with individuals as they transition out of the jail, because that can be anywhere from 24 hours a day to, you know, up to a year. Uh, but again, there isn't anyone in the jail that's going to be assigned to you. It's you're actually and I hate to say this, you're actually in a better situation if you're releasing from prison because you do have a counselor that's working with you on your transition. So they're going to be mapping out your 90 day, your 60 day, your 30 day release. Where are you going to be? Where are you going to reside? Um, uh, you know, what type of work are you going to you're going to need if you need medications, you need mental health treatment. All that's going to be worked out um, prior to your release. That's part of a, a, an assigned a release plan that's going to be put together before you release. And so that's for that's for all your prison inmates. Again, for those jail releases, there there isn't anybody doing that. So um we started the resource center in part for that reason. We have folks releasing from jail and we get them all the time who come out and they're angry because now I've got a no contact order. Um so I can't go back home. I've lost my job. I've lost my housing. And so they literally land at our doorstep 
at the resource center, like, well, what, what am I supposed to do now? And the court is, um, I'm obligated to fulfill all of these obligations for the court. So again, there's nobody that's directing me. Now, there is some assistance. If I have some, some mental health issues, there is the jail transition team, but I have to have a primary mental health disorder to, to receive those services. Um, and then again, that's that's voluntary as well. And a lot of times folks are not even, not even um, they don't want to reveal that they have mental health issues while they're in jail. They don't want to be victimized by other inmates in jail. So there's a lot of, of different things that occur for uh, reasons why somebody may not seek services while they're in custody. So that is that is a that is an issue when you have folks that are in jail again from 24 hours to up to a year and you have nobody working with them um, to get them set up. And the stats indicate that if you can start that transition process while somebody is in custody, you're going to have better outcomes for those individuals. But there really isn't anything in place. We do get some agencies that can get into the into the uh, the jail to assist folks like Pierce County Alliance can get in there and they can do some assessments um and that's a that's a great thing but uh they can get overwhelmed with uh, just the number of referrals uh, that are needed for folks with with SUD needs but uh, but again it, it's just it it seems you know when you think about it, it it seems like a person going to jail and getting out in in a brief amount of time would be in a better situation and that's often not the case in comparison to somebody that's getting um, released from prison. That's great. Uh, Sherry or Brian, did you want to add anything to that on some significant barriers that, that you all see? Um, so I would say specifically, I, I work with um, individuals who are leaving jail. And I think Dom, Dom really nailed it on the head. They've been in just long enough to the two, the two things I see, they've been in just long enough to lose employment, um, and then also the no contact order. So now you've had someone who may have went into jail employed and housed, and they come out unemployed. And and a, and some of them that we worked with, it's the first time they've ever experienced homelessness um, as a result of being incarcerated, and that incarceration could be six or seven months. And so um, we really do have you know, quite the challenge is, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, is providing wraparound services so that when you come, whatever your need is, you know, we can meet that. But I would say Dom nailed it on the head with the jail. They're in long long enough, just long enough to, to really lose everything in some instances. I think that's, yeah, but it always blows me away how, um, how little support systems are really involved in being released from jail and just the whole release process in itself is a nightmare. Um, I think that's a good, and I'm going to jump around on these questions y'all a little bit um, as we have this conversation. So what types of support systems and programs do you think are most effective um, that we have right now? And that well, can even lead into talking about the programs that that each of you have. But I want to I want to know a little bit more about like what what is what is somewhat successful. I'm going to jump in, Dom, because you're going to you're going to have some really great insight as well. But I want to piggyback on what you'd mentioned earlier with Pierce County Alliance and their wonderful, amazing program of going in and having navigators connect with folks pre-release in the jail system. Uh, I think that. I mentioned that and it's my favorite because it's wonderful and it's not enough. There's very specific eligibility requirements, uh, as Dom had alluded to, and in designing any system to work with individuals post-incarceration or as they're exiting jail, you have to start at the beginning. And folks going into the jail system, um, we everybody has a variety of different barriers, right? And so we've got to have customized solutions that start before just them walking out at 4 a.m. trying to figure out what's next. Yeah. Uh, and McDonald's, so when I, I my criminal justice uh, involvement is not something that I consider myself to be criminal justice impacted because I was really lucky that I was arrested five times over two or three years and I was only in for three or four days at a time at a max, right? I'm one of the privileged ones that I recognize very much so um, that I, when I did get out, it was 4 a.m. and I was able to go to McDonald's too. We don't even have that anymore as an option when folks are getting out. So um, back to the question about services that are available, Pierce County Alliance is 
probably the, the best in my opinion, and we need more diversified programming that doesn't have such stringent eligibility requirements. So go ahead, Don. I okay. think you, I think you covered it, uh, Sherry. I, I, I it escapes me what I was going to say, but I think you you did a great job of covering that. How many organizations are actually allowed to go into our our jail system? And Dom, can you talk a little bit about the numbers? I know you and I have had several meetings um, about recidivism or how many people are incarcerated or are in Pierce County Jail. Um, and so on. But what organizations, like that's a multi-faceted faceted question, but how many organizations are even allowed to go in the jail? And how often is that? It's it's very limited. I, I believe the two organizations that actually have people in the jail are Greater Lakes and uh, Pierce County Alliance. And that's not, that's not due to the jail not wanting those services because prior to COVID, um, we had quite a few programs and services going. The, the problem is there is a shortage of correctional officers, so it becomes a, it becomes a safety issue, um, and it just becomes a, a coverage issue, um, just like the, um, the issue with of uh, releasing folks at 4 a.m. And I know this has been a long, long standing. This battle has been fought on multiple occasions. Can we get the change, the time changed for uh, inmates re or defendants releasing? Um, and that comes down to a safety issue as well. And so it's a, it really comes down to a legislative issue um, when it comes to the, those jail release times. Um, so just uh, uh, the 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 lack of programming uh, again a large reason for uh, agencies being able to get into the jail is for that reason just the the lack of staff but then you have um, very very strict uh, background checks that occur as well so so very very strict background checks which is going to eliminate quite a few uh, individuals I think the jail. Jail entry is going to be one of the most difficult um, places for uh, partnering agencies to get into. So how do we connect with, with people coming out of the jail system? I know that was a hard question. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I mean, it's, it's always worthwhile to try to come up with a, with a proposal on the services that you want. The, and the jail is, is willing to listen to you know different different programs again it's going to come down to what are their staffing um are they going to be able to provide uh enough staff uh to accommodate um you know some of the escorting that needs to occur when you have uh outside agencies in the jail um you need to have somebody monitoring you know obviously for safety reasons so it it comes down to those it just comes down to those numbers one of the things that we had started um, with our pathways program was having um, Brian and Norma. Um, Norma is our, our specialist. They were meeting with defendants down in the pit where attorneys go, and that was that was that was great. And that was we you know we really started to get the ball rolling, but because we were utilizing it so much, it created more of a staff need for the jail. So they they shut that down after how how long would you say uh, Brian about a month? They shut that down and said we can't afford the the half staff there escorting the defendants down to the pit, which was a great area. Wow, that's that's intense. So how I mean, wow. Then and I know there's so many people on this meeting right now too who have these discussions around reentry at their at their organizations as to how we can get um, involved. So I think, I mean, I'm trying to like look at this so you have two organizations that can get into the jail sherry and brian why don't you talk a little bit about what vallejo is doing because you guys have launched a new a new program that's very re-entry focused let's dive into that a little bit how are you connecting um and what is what is working maybe what is not working and we're going to talk uh, hopefully we'll lead that into some employment stuff too is I think, you know, again, that's a huge barrier is you want to come out of jail and you need money because you need housing and you need food and you need so many things. So Sherry, why don't you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, I will start by talking about 
what the relationship is with Vallejo Pierce County District Court Resource Center and the criminal justice um, uh, impacted population. So with Vallejo specializing in working with folks experiencing homelessness, we recognize that year over year, we were seeing 50%, 60%, 70% of folks who were coming to us had some type of criminal justice impact. And so Dom and I connected a couple of years ago and really looked at what is the system as it's designed right now. And by and large, we recognize that there really isn't a great transition uh, system designed. And so we thought if Vallejo is a workforce development organization, employment is our focus, as is the homeless population, we certainly should not be an organization that is in a silo creating um, opportunities and programs in a reentry space. And in fact, even for organizations whose mission specifically is focused on reentry, such as Leveled Up, an amazing organization, uh, it doesn't take an organization. It takes a system and a community and an ecosystem. And so uh, Pierce County District Court Resource Center, Dom, uh, he connected with myself, with Amy, the COO at Pierce County Alliance, and he said, hey, there's these ARPA funds that are available. How can we leverage these, these funds to be sustainable and impactful and touch the, the most amount of people in an intentional way? And so we sat down and we designed a program that literally was an ecosystem of Pierce County Alliance addressing behavioral health needs as a primary focus, partnered with Vallejo for individuals who come out and say, I really just need a job. We know it's I never it's never I just need a job, right? But oftentimes people coming out say, I just need a job and I can move forward in my life. Um, so in addition to Pierce County Alliance and Vallejo with employment and behavioral health, we thought about what are the other barriers that folks transitioning might be impacted by and how can we bring subcontracted partners to the table? There are many organizations in our community that are doing really incredible work. Why should Vallejo or why should PCA develop financial counseling programs when we have sound outreach? And that's their entire mission. So we decided mm -hmm. to subcontract with them. Evergreen Empowerment, who has been in our community for years, Corwin Scott is their CEO. Um, they do expungement, legal navigation, uh, mentorship here. So why should we develop that programming? We decided to bring them in. So Pre-trial pathways originated as a program to provide customized wraparound support to individuals who had touched the uh, pre-trial services part of uh, municipal court. And I'll have Dom give some detail on what pre-trial services is. Recently, we recognized that pre-trial services was a much more narrow scope than we had thought. And so we've expanded it to anybody with district court involvement. Um, what pre what pretrial pathways is is an ecosystem that's an integrated service delivery model where we have accountability built within the ecosystem by subcontracted partners signing on to commit to providing certain outcomes and certain services and they're held accountable because they bill us for it and then we bill district court and then we bill commerce for it and so I'm very very much of the mindset that MOUs, as is traditionally the mindset of nonprofit partnerships, that is what the standard is. It's very easy to write a letter and say, I'm going to commit to doing this, but there's no accountability if we don't have outcomes. And oftentimes outcomes are tied to funding. And so um, I'll let Brian and Dom go more into what the program is. Brian's been operating it for quite a while now, and, and I'd love him to talk about it. Yeah, so that is, um, Norman, that is an answer to your question. Uh, do we have a test pilot program? We do have a test pilot program. Uh, we're operating it. Um, what was the original question? If I can ask that again, to make sure I don't double back on what Sherry shared. Geez, I don't know. I think it was off the cuff, Brian. I didn't even have that one written. Okay, down. great. Well, then I'll just talk about what we do. Like, then. let's talk about the program. We. Okay. So the <laughs> yeah, program let's talk itself, about what's successful, basically. Yeah. Let's so the program it. itself, we, um, originally we had three referring partners. So you had DAC lawyers. Um, you had the pretrial uh, services within the clerk's office, and then probation. And so any individual, um. We could receive a referral from them and then we, we would do an intake. Now that we've been able to expand it, uh, the name is Pre-Trial Pathways. Um, that's the name of the program. Uh, now we've been able to expand it within the last two or three weeks. So anyone who's ever had any district court involvement at any point in their history, 
um, are now el eligible for the program. And so what that looks like, they meet with myself as the uh, liaison, and then we're just identifying what barriers they have. And then which of the services are we going to enroll them in? Many of them get co-enrolled. So you, they may choose an employment pathway uh, as well as a mental health pathway. Um, we also have on board uh, Goodwill. They have a Goodwill Go program for the emerging adults, 18 to 24. And so they also serve as an employment pathway for those who are 18 to 24. And they have much more, I would say, personalized case management. Um, that surpasses just the employment um, out aspect of it. And so the model, what works great is that we have organizations that necessarily within themselves wouldn't be attached to reentry, but they provide a service that someone who is reentering into the population needs. And so I think that what works well with the process is I always say, how do we keep someone out of a crisis that may put them into a position to um, commit another crime, right? And so can we keep them out of a mental crisis? Can we keep them out of a financial crisis? Uh, what are those things we need to do? And so we use uh, our partnerships and the funding within that uh, to meet on an individual basis and then see what does that individual need? And then we're able to, um, to meet that. Um, I know later on there may be a question about like specific success stories, so I don't want to touch into that, but I think just wrapping them around. And, and so what Sherry and Dom built was excellent in terms of, um, and maybe there's probably still more organizations that could be a part of it. Um, but if someone were coming out, they would have employment uh, pathway, they would have a mental health, behavioral health, substance use, there would be financial uh, coaching. Um, if they were 18 to 24, there would be support there. There's also going to be support when it comes to um, expungement and looking at uh, their criminal record and seeing if, if are there any fines that can get paid off. So it's just giving them wraparound services so that they never hit that point of crisis or we can do whatever we can to help them uh, not hit that point of crisis. Um, I feel like you should talk about Work Crew Plus because it's it's my favorite part of the program because it's the part that Vallejo is is owning. And I think it's a beautiful relationship, not only with District 4, but with the county as well. I, I, I want to first start. Um, I, I talked with our um, our program coordinator yesterday, uh, Ryan, and we were actually talking about Vallejo and talking about, um, you know, prior to our Work Crew Plus, uh, Vallejo having this rapid employment and he just talked to me about how frequently he referred individuals who that was the one thing they needed i i went to jail i lost my job i i, I don't have any behavioral health needs but i need to get rapidly employed i still have my place i need to come up with some income really quickly and he talked about how important that was to be able to get that rapid employment again there was nothing there's nobody working with you in the jail just on that. There, there isn't anyone that's going to sit down with you and ask, well, what are, what are, what are your needs? Again, if you've got some behavioral health needs, there, there is some, some transitional assistance with that. But when you have that individual, I just need to get back to work as soon as possible so I don't lose everything. Um, so I just, I, I, I thought it was a, 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 a appropriate to bring that up because Brian and I did uh, not Brian and I Ryan and I just had this conversation yesterday about the importance of having that service available um but with the work crew plus uh again knowing um Sherry's background uh in employment um when these ARPA funds uh became available uh Sherry was the first person I thought of um and again specifically that employment connection, um, and I know how valuable that is for the the clients that we work with because they're going to have all kinds of barriers, including their their criminal history. Um, and you know, I'm working with Sherry and developing the Work Crew Plus program. Our Work Crew Plus program um, is really an extension of our our Work Crew. the The court runs a Work Crew, which is professional level uh, landscaping. It's been around for a number of years, probably twenty years. Um, they do a lot of the work throughout the county. Again, it's not grunt work. It's not needless work. 
It is work they'll put together. Uh, a perfect example is when there's flooding on um, the work crew, um, they will get sandbags together that is needed for some of those areas that flood out in the Puyallup Valley in, in, in different areas of the of the county. So this is valuable and needed work. Um, so that's just one example when there are um, any types of memorials that are done for fallen officers work crew does a lot of the work in preparing some of those memorials um, on top of maintaining a lot of the facilities um, throughout the county. And this saves the county and the taxpayer a lot of money too. This is this is a, a, a real cost saving um, program as well. But it also provides job skills trainings for individuals that engage in work crew. So again, this is not meant to be punished punishment. This is meant for individuals to walk away with um, developed skills, getting themselves up, committing to something under sometimes not the best conditions. Um, and again, the work that is done in work crew is similar to the work that, that is done in different county departments. So again, the work that is done in work crew, the work that the work crew participants engage in is some of the same work that individuals who are employed by the county engage in. And that's again, some of the landscaping work that is done, some of the, the, some of the maintenance work, some of the painting that gets done. Some of those roles, some of that work is county paid positions. So it started, uh, I don't know, five years ago, the county started reaching out to the probation department because every year they have extra hire positions that go unfilled. Every year there's these extra hire positions in planning and public works and parks and rec. Um, these are up to six months uh, of employment and these are positions that um, can lead to permanent employment. And you know there was a time where they uh, had enough staff, they had enough applicants, but over time, I think we've all seen where Filling positions has has declined. Uh, you, you, we're not getting a large amount of pools, so those departments are not getting a large number of pools um, for those positions. And so, um, really, out of necessity, uh, the county has dropped a lot of the restrictions, requirements, background checks. Really, out of necessity, we don't have enough talent. We don't have enough people applying for these positions to fill them. So we we have to adjust. Um, we have to adjust and we need to we need to open the doors and, and become more available uh, to individuals that do have backgrounds. Hence them reaching out to individuals on our work crew. Um, and it started with them actually observing individuals performing those duties, like seeing the same guys there every day. Hey, what's that guy's background? What, what, do, you, what do you think about having him apply for a position? And so that grew into, wow, that's if they're actively recruiting, how can how can we expand this? And so Sherry and I got together a few years ago. Um, she came across some funds to, you know, get this rolling um, to have individuals who have completed their work crew obligations for the for the for the court. Um, they can transition into work crew plus where they're going to have subsidized wages. So they're going to engage in the same type of work that they were already doing. The great thing about this and the great thing that the county likes about this is um, when they've had individuals who apply for those those extra hire positions, they may not know anything about it. So they'll find that they'll get 30 applicants after about two days of employment. They're like, yeah, this is not for me. I don't like being outdoors in the elements. Well, when you've got folks who have done work crew and work crew plus for a number of months, and we have several individuals right now, they know what they're getting into. So when the time comes to apply for those county positions, it's not a surprise to them what the work is. They've already developed the skills. They've already shown the commitment. So with work crew plus, again, it's going to be subsidized employment. They're being paid for the same work that they were doing. And the hope is that they're going to transition into the extra higher positions with the county or into permanent positions. And so those individuals can get an endorsement for completing that work crew plus program, which guarantees that their application gets pulled for, for an interview. So they have a very good chance of getting that job. And the great thing about this, anybody that's eligible for work crew plus is eligible for county employment. There are some limitations, uh, you know, if you, if you don't have a driver's license, but even that um, is not necessarily a, a barrier. 
Um, some of the positions that are in those those departments don't require a license. So it, it really depends on the type of position. But this is something that um, was just really not open to individuals that had uh, had backgrounds. So so this is a great opportunity, and we really want to get the word out to folks that government employment is available for you. It, 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 the doors are not shut. And again, this is this has become a necessity. There's a lot of retirements. This is a great opportunity for people of color to get into positions that have historically been held by white males. And this is coming directly from the heads of those departments. These are positions that have been traditionally held by white males. And that's not a bad thing, but you know, you're going to when you when you see advertisements for those open positions, you're going to inform people that you know. So you're going to go back to your community and you're going to let people know. So you're going to end up with pretty much the same type of population filling those positions. Well, with all these retirements that are coming up, again, necessity is driving a lot of this. Um, it is a great opportunity for individuals who may not, uh, may never have thought that there was any kind of opportunity in these fields. Because if you if you took a look from the outside and you see who's employed, you would think, well, I I, I don't see myself represented there, so I would never apply. That's that's completely changed. You can if you walk around now and you see some of the positions that are filled, you're going to see a lot more people of color. So again, the the tide has changed, and this is a great opportunity. And we really want to get the word out for individuals to apply. And if you do work who plus, you're going to you're going to have that you're going to get your foot in the door. And did you say who's eligible? Did you mention that, Dom? Who's yeah, eligible? So for work if crew? you're eligible for our work crew, and there are some limitations, so sex offenses and um, if you have any physical limitations, then you would not be eligible for a work crew. But those are the two biggest things that um, can prevent somebody being, from being eligible for work crew plus or for, for work crew and work crew plus. Yeah. And I think this is a great time to talk about other, I mean, just employment in general. I mean, in the conversations we had, I was pretty blown away by, you know, one, the recidivism rate from jail. I believe it was somewhere over 85 percent, something like that, Dom. And I remember being it is pretty high. By, yeah, by that number, like, man, how are we contact? Our, how are we letting people know that there's opportunities out there? And then as we dove more into it, I'm like, hold on. How do you find the opportunities? How are people coming to us? And that was where we notice a gap. Like at WorkSource, we didn't have anybody specifically working on reentry, but we did have a lot of justice involved people coming in and we weren't aware of the barriers and so on. So just those conversations have, you know, like uh, gotten us to do so many different things with reentry. But Sherry, I want to talk about employment with you a little bit. We kind of discussed this on the phone last night, but you know, what are some common misconceptions with folks, you know, who are justice involved, obviously, but are looking for employment? I mean, sometimes people are like, well, the only thing I can do is get into the union, but we know unions haven't always been get easy to get into, or, you know, they do it just seems like there's a lot of focus on this is the only thing I can do. So why apply for a job? Because I'm not going to qualify anyway. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, before we do that, I want to say when I did work crew many years ago, it was more of a grunt labor position. We were working, we were mucking out stalls. It's where I learned how to mow a lawn and do some weed eating. So the work crew plus program or work crew in general has expanded significantly since, you know, my 15 years ago. Um, I think some of the misconceptions from the employer's lens is that one story is everyone's story. I think that there's an overwhelming fear of when somebody comes with a criminal justice background that this is somebody who is going to continue to perpetuate making poor decisions, or this is somebody who, because they were in jail, because they were in prison, they were incar incarcerated, they're a criminal. And I think that is just overwhelmingly the worst misconception that, that we can think of because human beings are so unique and so dynamic and one decision and, uh, you know, a series of mistakes, potentially, it doesn't define who we are. And so uh, employers, oftentimes when I'm out in the community, one of the biggest things I hear is, well, my, my insurance, I'm going to lose my insurance. And that's, that's simply not true. It's an education, not only of the employer, but sometimes the insurance companies too. 
uh, there are some insurance companies who do have some pretty stringent requirements. And so if we understand what those requirements are, we can offer solutions. The Fidelity and Bond Program, for one. What's it called? It's the, uh, I had to write these down, the Federal Bonding Program, FBP. I'm big on acronyms. Um, so if there, if you can't get in, insured, then there is opportunities for you to make sure that liability is lessened. Uh, there's also significant benefits with the WOTC tax credit. So if you take a chance and you hire somebody with criminal justice impact, you as, an, as a business can get pretty significant federal tax relief. And so uh, the misconception just isn't the stereotype. And I think the fear is what's behind the not learning for ourselves and then educating our insurance companies, our partners, our communities. So then I'll, sorry, I'll jump in because um, you asked, you said from the employer specific um, what is there? And then I would say from the from the individuals that we deal with is very much I I have to eat the crumbs off the table mentality. Um, and so when you're meeting with them, what you get is like we try to be very career focused. Um, many of the individuals that we're meeting with, they're really between the ages of, I mean, I would say 18 to 45. So still a, a lot of their working years are ahead of them. But their expectation is because I have a criminal record, then I can't really focus on a career. And so um, they they tend to think they have to take menial jobs, which don't pay as much. And so part of what we're doing with the Work Crew Plus is getting people career focused. Um, also with that, uh, here at Vallejo, they also have um, an employment navigator who's helping them with their resume, who's helping them with the application, a vocational specialist, helping them with their applications. Um, really walking with them on that journey um, each step of the way. Um, you know, we've had people now, even the, the program really launched and started going in February, and already we've had some individuals that have moved into uh, careers that, that's going to offer exponential growth. And so I think that's one of the challenges is getting our individuals who are coming out of the system, coming out of jail to see like, this isn't the end of your life. And that's my story, uh, being criminally justice impacted, this feeling that, okay, what can I, is there a career for me? Or do I just have to take whatever? And there was a lot of time where I was taking jobs and taking positions that didn't really serve the need that I had financially or the goals that I had for my career. But I felt like, well, that's all that I, I I'm good enough for based on my record. And so I think helping them overcome that, that's where even PCA comes in, involved is sometimes it's just having a, a a navigator, someone to help walk that with What's you. What's PCA, Brian? Pierce County Alliance. And so having them as a partner, they, you know, they have um, peer navigate, navigation specialists, and it really doesn't matter what our participants bring to them, they're going to work with them to help them overcome, you know, some of the mindsets and the fears that they have. So how do you think that we as a, as a, as a task force can help kind of change that narrative around employment? I mean, is there, obviously we can do advocacy, we can support and encourage more inclusive hiring practices. Is there anything else that you could see us doing as a group to to really get employers, more employers to maybe look at things on a case by case basis or just, you know, hire more individuals with a criminal background? What do you what do you see us doing? I'm going to hop in here because I love solution creation. It's my favorite thing. And I think that when we have really wonderful opportunities or programs, oftentimes if we're resistant, we don't want to go out and learn about it. And so I, as an organization, I have to go out oftentimes and sell my really wonderful solutions and programs and help individuals see that it's a benefit. So I think the WOTC tax credit up to $2,400 for the first two years of employment if we can market that and get that in the hands of employers as a solution, not only are you getting uh, much needed talent, but also you're gonna you're gonna save some money on it. Is is something that we can do if we can design a sales package that goes over. Uh, what are the benefits as an employer? Well, one of the benefits is if you have somebody who's been incarcerated, if they did uh, serve prison time, then oftentimes they're coming out, they're skilling up, right? They are they can be getting any type of college degree, they can be working for really crappy wages, but they're developing skill sets. 
Uh, when I'm out in the community talking to employers right now, the number one thing that I'm hearing is I want consistency. And then the second thing is positive attitude. Uh, when you have folks who are on a rigid schedule for weeks, months, years at a time, they're coming out with the ability to maintain a routine. And so if we talk about consistency, so I think um, really creating a sales package to get in front of employers, of here's this really wonderful opportunity that I don't think you're considering. Here's the list of why you might not be considering it. And here's the list of why you maybe should. Um, we as human beings need to be incentivized and need to be sold on solutions. So I think this is a really powerful group. There's really powerful people here. And I think that um, y'all could do a lot of good. Anybody else want to jump in on that? No. Um. So I want to look at some of the questions in the chat as well, too. And I think that we can do this on this next question. So let's talk about again, and we're going we're gonna to go straight at this. So what programs have been, what services have been successful? And I would love for you guys to call out some names. So we have Venus had asked about driver's license, I believe also about housing. Like, let's go back to those barriers. So our ultimate goal is employment. I imagine for most people, um, a pretty quick employment, but we know there's some barriers to that. So who are we using? Like you come out, you don't have a driver's license. You don't have an ID. You have no access to a birth certificate. What are we doing? How, how are we remedying that? We, we have relicensing at the resource center. So, um, Definitely, if you have district court matters holding up your license, you're you're going to you're going to get everything that you need. You're going to get all the information that you need, as well as an opportunity to pay off your fines through alternative means, utilizing our alternative programs. Whether it's our day reporting program, Kelly, where you would present, you should present all the time with goodwill. You get $150 off your fines for every eight hours that you participate in the day reporting program. It's the same thing for our work crew, eight hours equals $150 off your fines. At the same time, we're going to take a look at your driver's abstract. That's for anybody. We'll take a look at your driver's abstract. We'll, we'll map out what you need to do, how you can pay off those fines. Um, if you have fines that are outside of district court, um, we have we have templates for the type of letters that you can send to the court to at least ask the court to waive your interest fees. So being a court ourselves, we we know the language, we know how to uh, communicate with other courts. Hey, uh, my name is Joe Smith. I'm doing uh, I'm participating in the day reporting program with Pierce County District Court. I'm hoping that I can have my fees waived. Um, I'm trying to meet all of my obligations, but right now my license is being held up because of all these all these fines. Uh, in good faith, I wanted to sh show you my certificate of completion with Pierce County District Court, and I'm hoping um, that uh, this can assist uh, the court in making a determination as to whether or not you can waive my, my fees. So those are the types of things that are done um, in district court. And so that's that's for anybody. We you, you may not have district court matters, but if you do, you definitely have a pathway in getting your license back. If you don't have district court matters, we can still provide you with the information on how you can get your license back. And so that's for anybody. So, Dom, they just show up to the court show up. center? Just show up. Okay. Just show up. I, I, my, I've, got, I've got fines on my license. I don't know which courts I'm in. Can you guys look me up and tell me what, wh where, where are my issues? And so we'll get you, we'll get you squared away. That's what's up. Um, Brian, I saw you, I mean, you got some. Yeah. So I would say um, two parts to that. The, if you're going to launch a program, having the funding that is going to help minimize those is going to be the most important thing. So with our um, pre-trial pathways, we do have a significant amount of funding. So we're able to do that. License, we really say any barriers that you have, um, between for for work um, and so we're taking care of license we're getting you um, a phone if you don't have a phone when you get out social security cards uh, birth certificates if you need to get those ordered when you start working we're purchasing your work clothes your work gear personal protective gear um, orca cards if you need to get to and from on the bus um, with that I saw a question about housing we we've partnered with 
uh, comprehensive life resources. And so uh, many of the participants that we're dealing with, they do qualify and it's a process, but uh, so far we've had four people receive um, shared housing, up to six months of shared housing that's free to them um, through comprehensive life resources. We also have used funding to help three people get permanently housed. Um, we use some of the funding to help someone avoid an eviction. Um, and so uh, here at Vallejo, a lot of times if our participants that are coming are individuals that are coming to pretrial pathways, we have a separate program that if they're experiencing homeless at the same time, homelessness, we'll come and roll them and then they get into our services uh, at Vallejo. So now they really have two sets of fundings uh, that they have that we can pull from that can go to reducing those barriers. Um, and so that's where that, that case management comes in is we're really just identifying barriers um, and then we're removing those barriers. So having that funding as part of it, um, understanding that those barriers are going to be common. The driver's license and the phone it's, it's, I mean, it's just really common when it comes to this population. And so we're able to take care of those things um, as a result of the funding that we receive. I love that. You know, for, I am such a, I'm a huge fan of listservs. Um, I always have been. I think it's an easy way for us to, to focus on a specific area. I know we have a great listserv through the Pierce County Coalition and Homelessness for those experiencing homelessness. I mean, so many questions have answered. Have we ever talked about a listserv specifically for justice-involved individuals? I'm going to hop in and say no, because I haven't heard it. Dom, you might have, but I like perked up when you said that, because I am the same, Kelly. I love listservs. If we if we don't have one, we should. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we should. We need a we need an expert to put that to put that together for us. Um, I also uh, there was a child support question here, and I saw Stephanie. Thank you so much for uh for talking about our or calling out alternative solutions. Um, Brian, Sherry, Dom, do you guys know about alternative solutions and want to talk about that? Because I think that is a resource that we just don't talk about enough. As we know, child support is. Ooh, that can be a barrier. Yeah. Alternative yeah, Solutions is an amazing program. Uh, back in 2018, when I launched Vallejo, I was coming off working with a federally funded program called BFED, Basic Food Employment and Training. Uh, they had a three-year pilot that I was operating and, from 2015 to 2018. And part of that pilot program was a relationship between DSHS and Alternative Solutions. And so there was funding that was made available to create this partnership in which uh, I, as a case manager, could call Alternative Solutions. I had one dedicated rep and say, hey, I've got this participant. Can you look him up? They'd look him up and they'd say, oh, he's got $120,000 because he just did nine years and he's got five kids. This is actually a real situation. And um, mom was on TANF as the custodial parent. And so because this money is owed to the state and not the custodial parent, we can wipe all of this, all of these funds away, which we did. So we helped to wipe out millions of dollars in back child support. So uh, when folks are incarcerated for a significant amount of time, they're supposed to have uh, case managers who are working to it, interject in these services. Oftentimes it doesn't happen. And then folks are coming out with sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in back support. If it's owed to the state, it should be justifiable and being able to back that out. So if we had funding to create that relationship with alternative solutions again, we don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars. We need to pay for the program fees and a case manager. Then that's something that we have access to. So um, since the pilot concluded back in 2018, the relationship with alternative solutions is a bit more limited uh, due to their own staffing constraints and just what they're able to do. And so right now, individuals have to self-refer into the system so they can call alternative, um, uh, whatever the name is, I always go back to, to acronyms. Uh, but if I'm a case manager and I have a participant who's got back child support, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to call them with them and help guide the conversation into getting their needs met. Oftentimes what they're looking at is removing a hold right away from a driver's license. Um, I like to think of this entity as the, as the advocate for the NCP, the non-custodial parent, and that they really look at what are your needs right now and how can we customize support? You got to hold on your driver's license, we'll remove that. Um, support services, clue, uh, clothes, 
food, employment access. They're a great entity and they're really capable of more if we could generate the funding for that relationship. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, another one that I, another organization I want to touch on. I mean, I just I know all of these organizations and I very rarely do direct services anymore, with the exception of collaboration for a cause and having organizations come out. But uh, can anybody touch on um, Evergreen Empowerment and the services that they offer and how how do you contact them? Who can do it? I want Brian or Dom to answer this one because I'm biased because Corwin's on our board. He is the, the executive <laughs> director. So I can just text him. Um, Dom, Brian, what's your what's your relationship with the general communities with Evergreen Empowerment? So we've just we've been able to we have both our programs. So they are a partner in our in our pretrial pathway. So that makes it very easy. Um, in some of the other services, we've just been able to email them and email the information for our participants um, to them or have the participants reach out to them directly. Um, but my experience has just been uh, mainly as a MOU partner. So, Dom, if you have you know more than that to share, I, that's what I have. Yeah, and we've been presenting in our day reporting uh, program uh, each week. Uh, they have a representative that comes in and, and just makes uh, the clients that are in our uh, day reporting program aware of the services. I, I want to add that the individuals that participate in our day reporting, they, they are the highest utilizers of our services. So um, these are the folks that are taking advantage of everything that's available in the resource center, from the clothing bank to the food pantry, to the relicensing, to the getting reconnected with uh getting their high school diploma. And Andrew, the supervisor there, just assisted the individual in getting connected to the Clover Park Tech. So those folks are taking advantage of every resource that's available in the resource center. Um, so again, if you're if you're there at the resource center uh, and you're doing a day reporting uh, program, it's, it's not gonna be punishment. You're gonna get exposed um, to so many different services and you may, you may enter the program angry because you have to be there, but you're going to walk away if, you, if you're if you willing to open yourself up and you're going to find a lot of the services and a lot of support that you just didn't expect to get from the court. I love that. I was really going after the opportunity for expungement or vacating your charges because that is huge because, again, that's one of those things that we hold over our head for so long as I have these charges maybe there within 10 years and in some cases, they're even older and you just want to get rid of it. I know Evergreen Empowerment and Corwin over there have just been amazing at helping everybody who comes through their doors to, to see what they can do on that. Um, they've been pretty awesome. Let's talk a little bit about vocational training and education. And in just a few minutes, y'all, I'm going to open up more questions to the group. But what role do you think like vocational uh, training, education, and so on. Like, what role do you think that plays in like a successful, you know, reentry story? And we're going to talk about that next. So get your stories ready. But what's, what do you think about education and training? And I know there's been a lot of talk too about paid education and training, as we've said so many times in this conversation that coming out of uh, just being justice involved in general, you, you're looking for money because oftentimes that's a big factor in recidivism is I don't have enough money to do anything. So let's talk about education and training for a second. What role do you think that plays? I'm going to hop in um, because I love that you say said paid. So when we think about education and training, I, I'm going to get on my soapbox here for a for a little minute, uh, I know federal, would. <laughs> the federal <laughs> government is known for investing in large, very expensive social welfare systems that create band-aids for temporary um, symptoms and don't really create the solutions for the long-term problems. And if we look at subsidized wages, which is like my favorite word together, subsidized wages are literally Vallejo or other entities pay the wages of individuals and then we build a government for it. So in a way, it's another social welfare support system, but it's not just a social welfare support system. It's short-term investment for long-term independence. And so if we think about uh, our education system, our public education system, our secondary education system, 
when I was a single mom and I had dropped out of school at 16, just barely got my GED and wanted to get my associates at 27, how was I supposed to work full time, take care of my baby, pay for childcare, and then also go to go to college and finish up my associate's degree? I had to work the system. I had to get voluntarily fired from a job so that Workforce Central could pay for my worker retraining benefits. So then I could take a year off, go to school full time and pay my bills. And I think that that's a great example of the systems that we have to design. They literally invested in me. They paid me to go to school and look at where, where we're at right now, right? Short-term investment for long-term um, independence is, is so critical. So vocational training is my preferred method of education. I tell my daughter, who's 12 years old right now, if you don't want to go to college, don't. We can look at some type of vocational training program and hopefully by the time she goes to college, we're going to have short-term vocational training programs that she gets paid to do it. If we're thinking about our workforce and the lack of talent, and as Don mentioned earlier, we have folks who are retiring, getting folks into trades, getting folks into labor positions is harder now than ever before. People who are my age and younger, if it's going to sound stereotypical, and I don't want to, but there's a lot of young folks who just don't have that sense of, of hard work and labor built into them. And that's okay, but we need to be able to promote um, trades and vocational training. So, so I'm a big believer in let's not only help people go to school by paying for them to learn a skill, but let's pay them to do it while they're doing it. That's off my soapbox now. No, I love that. I think paid, paid training is just at this point, it is just so crucial. I mean, we just live in such an expensive, especially our area of Pierce County. It's just so damn expensive. You you can't live without, let alone one income. I mean, two incomes would be great, but one income is a necessity. Brian, do you have anything you want to add to education and training or should we get into um, success stories or what's your take? Yeah, I would just, I would, I would, I would quickly piggyback on what Sherry said and, and just explain that it, all of our community colleges um, have a BFET program and they have different um, grants and funding that they have for participants who, um, even if they're not on food assistance, who are, live under a certain, make a certain amount of money or under that. Mm -hmm. And we've seen success in in getting people, um, having individuals go and, and based on their grants, I had an individual that received $4,000 from the college because BFET paid for his college and the grants that he got came to him as a refund. And then he was able to use that $4,000. At the time he enrolled, he was um, homeless and he used that to pay for uh, living expenses. And so um, I do think back to an earlier question is when we get them in that training, the pay work experience, again, we're getting them career focused. And that's another step if we can support them. We've done that through Vallejo uh, in the city of Olympia. We were doing paid work experience for people that were getting their peer certification. So not only were they getting certified, but we were paying for them to get three months of experience. So the certification and the experience met at the same time and now they're able to apply for um, for jobs. So I think it's just important again in helping change the mindset from temporary jobs to building a career. I love that. Um all right. So before we jump into some more uh some questions from the rest of the task force. Now, I don't want to let's let's talk about I want to hear what worked. It's not necessarily a success story as much as I want to hear like what has worked, but I also want to hear what doesn't work when we're talking about justice involved individuals so that we can really as a group we're looking at more innovative programs that either we can create or partner on, which would be my biggest hope. I love a great collaboration between many, many organizations. But um, tell me about something, Brian, we'll start with you. Can you tell me about a client um, where it where it did work and what please don't use any any like personal information, but like what did work? What services were provided immediately? What happened that this, you know, success continues on? And if you have anything about what didn't work or a time when you saw it absolutely fail. Tell me about yeah. that. So um, the client that I can think of, we've had a couple where it was just, but the one that was just the enormous success story, um, what worked was the wraparound services. And so she received services from Evergreen Empowerment and they were able to help reduce the amount of fines that she had to pay. Um, she received services from PCA 
And so they were, she was going through some mental health crisis. And so they were able to help her there. And then on the, um, she had driver's license that she wasn't able to, uh, reasons why she couldn't work because of lack of a license. We were able to help take care of that. Um, she had some, we were also able to help her reunify with her sons. She had two sons. And so, and then on the employment process, we were able, she's actually um, just got her um, certified to become a licensed uh, agent at um, uh, like a state farm. And then also we were able to get her housed and so she has temporary housing for free now while she works with our financial uh, coaching um, sound um, outreach to help budget and get ready to move into her own place. So what worked was in every area that she had a need, there was something within the program to meet the need. Um, that's when it works well is when you can meet the specific need with an organization. I think with an organization that is a an expert in that, because like Sherry said, we could have tried on our own. We would have fallen short uh, in some of these areas because we just weren't, you know, for all of the desire that we would have had um, to help her, we wouldn't have had the experience. And so what works is when a, a group of organizations um, each that has something specific to offer can come together and say, hey, we will utilize our expertise for these individuals. And, and so she's one that probably touched all but one of, uh, of the partners um, within it. The Honestly, what I would say what doesn't work, the difficulty is, the biggest difficulty we've had is um, and I think with any programming is really keeping the uh, them engaged through the process when it doesn't happen quickly, um, because just sometimes it just doesn't. And so how do we keep them engaged? How do we keep them um, motivated when they've put in three or four applications and it didn't come out or uh, when they've applied for housing, but they didn't uh, qualify for the housing. And so, um, I think that's where we've seen the difficult part is when we've had them fully engaged, we've seen success. Um, but keeping that success train rolling, keeping the positive momentum is, is man, that's the, the largest challenge um, because they don't necessarily trust us when we say hang with us. They don't know us. They've been told that many, many times. So trust is built by results. And so building that, getting results quickly um, and effective results when that doesn't happen then we 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 can lose them there that was great that was an amazing answer i'm Don gonna i'm gonna add on to, to some of the some of the things that um we've identified that are that are issues and that was and i was just learning from uh, the st stats that brian and norma put together the clients that we lose contact with, we don't have good contact information. So they may have made that contact with the individual. They may have received that referral from the attorney, um, but there's no good con contact information. There isn't a good address. There isn't a good phone number. There isn't a good email. Um, so they get out again. You're getting out at four o'clock. I'm going to do, I'm getting out at four. I'm going to go figure out what I need to do to survive. And so, you know, Norma and Brian, they repeatedly try to contact folks, but we do have that population that there just isn't good contact uh, information on top of those early releases. And so I see that still being a population and it's frustrating um, that we can't we can't figure out how to reach that population. But that has been throughout my career, 25 years, that that's been that's been the issue. I know when I um in, in previous uh, probation departments I worked for, and if I had a client with significant special needs that I knew was just not going to make it um to the next destination, I literally waited down at the bottom of Ninth and Tacoma Avenue for the jail releases and waited for my guys to walk down the hill as they groups of, of men and women would walk down the hill 
with their with their bag of, of personal items. And then I would walk them into my building and get them connected, give them knapsacks or whatever it was, because I knew if I didn't make that connection once they got out and there was not that immediate connection, they, they were gone. The same thing happened when we when the True Blood program started here uh, in Pierce County. And there was all that funding for True Blood participants. Again, very high needs individuals. Um, that there was funding available for them, but again, uh, and there was also uh, services for MAT, but again, the problem was folks getting out at four, we directed them to the resource center. If I'm getting out at four and I got to wait for the doors to open at 830, yep. that's a lot to ask. It, it may be cold, it may be raining. So again, we still have that population um, that, that that we're not reaching and it's for a number of reasons but i i you know getting the data back from brian and norma not having that good contact information um that that's another that's another um area that we've got to figure out um and one thing we've done to to help keep individuals engaged through the process we've just begun to do is incentivize their effort and so um, each step of the way, like if they fill out, once they fill out a certain amount of applications, there's a financial incentive. Uh, when they come to the orientation, there's a financial uh, incentive when they actually become employed. So understanding that because that process isn't always, you know, a, a two or three week process in terms of getting them employed, we want to make sure that we're incentivizing them along the way and we are financially helping them um, be able to buy, you know, basic needs, foods, hygiene. Um, so just letting them know that, hey, we're we're with you not only in support, but financially we're with you through this journey as well. And so that's really been, um, we've really seen an increase in the, in the follow-up from our participants going from, it's really those initial three, there's like three steps that we can lose them uh, early in the process. And we've really seen an increase of participants remaining through those three steps because they know, hey, if I show up, fill out this paperwork, you know, they're giving me a Fred Meyer gift card and I'm running up to the store and getting and getting what I need. And so um, again, the funding that the, being creative with your funding to identify um, what the hangups are and then how do we how do we um, counter or counteract those, uh, I think is super important. I love that. Those were excellent answers. A lot of insight there too. Um, I'm going to open it up now for the group to ask questions. And I, uh, you could turn your cameras on if you want to or not, whatever you want to do now. But I'd love to just popcorn in some questions and or some comments. So if you're part of an organization that has something to do with justice involved individuals or a reentry thing that you may be doing, please feel free to comment um, now, not necessarily in like a commercial style. But I think it's really important for us to understand what our ecosystem of justice involved individuals looks like. What does our design look like? How have we mapped this out in our community? And the only way we're going to know is if uh, if you all can say what, you know, just a little bit about what you do, but definitely any any questions. And then tomorrow, I'd also ask you to pop back in here. If you want to help facilitate questions for a second, that would be great. Anybody, anybody? I see Venus. Venus, you've been so active. Thank you so, 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 so much for uh, keeping us involved in this too. Did you want to just ask your question? I'm sorry, there have been so many, I'm not sure which one to ask. So <laughs> hi, everybody. I'm back down here in Pierce County, and it's so good to see so many of y'all from when I was at Sound Outreach. Sherry, it's been a pleasure to listen to you and your staff and, and just get to hear what's going on down this way. So I appreciate y'all um, having me today. Thank you. Um, so because when I was at Sound Outreach, and I actually have a great nephew that's having issues with this right now, um, the licensing part. So Sherry, it sounds like you guys are handling it over at Vallejo. And I believe it was Dominique um, that you guys can do it, which you guys were doing it back then when I was here, but I just wasn't sure if things had changed and stuff. So I thank you so much for that. Uh, the housing part is still, I know, you know, so difficult for everyone. I know Pierce County is working on it and 
habitat and things. But one of the last questions I think I had was about um, how do we make that change? Because it seems like everyone has been very clear that people getting out at four or four thirty in the morning is not, you know, helpful. Of course. So then, what do we do as this task force? How do we try to make that happen? to change that legislative, what, what do we need to do? I'm coming off me only to say, Dom, this is a, I envision a world where the district court resource center opens up at 4 a.m. And as people are getting released, they're getting their bag of stuff and then they're getting the directions to knock on your door. Had that same vision, and I was thinking of uh, recovery navigators being housed there. Um, yeah, I've, I've had that same. I've had that same thought. Um, I, I think that is a potential solution that would require um, probably some grants and some partnering with some agencies. Um, it would not be, it couldn't be um, county. Uh, they're just because there isn't any county position to fill that role. So I'm thinking uh, having a partnership with an agency that could possibly provide that. But yeah, I, I love that idea. I love that idea. Venus, it all comes down to money all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yep, we know, but they, you know, we're saying that there are monies out there, you know, the ARPA money, and I've heard that I was at a conference back in, um, uh, where was it, uh, Detroit, and they were talking about how they've been using um, um, TANF funds for general or guaranteed income and stuff. It's like there's that money can be used, you know, all over the place. So I think as community, we need to look at what does it look like to find those buckets of money? And Sherry, we know you're so good at this. All right. You know, we see y'all out there. Um, but yeah, let's let's try to figure it out. I love that. For those who don't know, Venus and I worked together at Sound Outreach. So she was at the early part of Vallejo's journey as I was talking about it. So Venus, Vallejo is essentially rise on steroids with immediate access to income. So all the work I did at Vallejo or at Sound is the work that Vallejo is doing. And you're doing a great job. I'd love to see you rising. Norman? Yeah, um, needless to say, I'm really biased towards Vallejo. They do an incredible job. Um, Let's talk about smaller agencies, because in Fife, we are not the huge Tacoma. We don't have access to the resources. We are on a much smaller scale looking at community court, but we're envisioning exactly what you're doing now. Love to have a meeting with you, Brian, just to uh, pick your mind to talk about partnerships and probably trying to replicate what you're doing. But again, I think the key is funding, because when you have capacity issues, I mean, I have a team of four. I have one dedicated person and she's only part-time within our court system. How do we replicate that? Because when you have a program that works, it needs to be replicated. Why re and create the wheel? So we are just starting this in Fife and um, running into numerous issues. So it's so awesome to hear the evolution of this program and keep doing the great job you're doing. But I will be reaching out just so I could pick your mind to see how can we recreate this. Yeah, I look I look forward to that. Um, to quickly answer the question, I think the, the the thing that's worked best for us is the support from multiple organizations of one one group alone, not attempting to tackle the issue by themselves. But yeah, we can definitely. Um, I, I put my email in the chat, so I look forward to to hearing from you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sherry. I do love that, Norman, and thanks for sharing that. I mean, City of Fife, that is definitely something you're doing really well down there that we could even do better up here is having 
um, you know, somebody who's directly connected to the court system and is able to work within homeless services and so on and has so many other great resources as well. We could definitely do that better. It's almost a navigator style um, that we've talked about so many times through, you know, work source, ESD and so on is just having somebody that has those direct connections. Because as Brian pointed out as well, there's that need for this immediate connection. And I absolutely understand that. I mean, our entire society is like that right now, but you want to see results. And I love Brian too, how you said that trust was that, that trust was built on results. That hit me. That hit me hard because that's so true. How do we, how do we build that? How do we make that connection more immediate? Yeah, I love that. But I I also think, and, and Dom spoke on it earlier, and um, Norman just spoke on it a minute ago. It's a, uh, you know, we have so many great organizations out here doing great things, and you know, when we talk about money, we talk about you know partnerships and grants, and I think that that's something that a lot of organizations stray away from. You know, it's like they 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 see, and it's weird to me. They see this pocket of money that seems big for one organization. But most of that money is going towards the staff to even try to do the job. So by the time they get it, they can't even do what they said that they were going to do rather than getting with a few organizations and saying, yo, I know you're great at this. You're great at this. We're great at this. Let's go in on this grant together. Why? Because when we get it, we don't have to go look for other people. We don't stop the progress from moving. We start, we hit the ground running because we already know who's part of that because we've already partnered. And that comes with us conversating. That comes with us finding out about each other. And that's why these meetings are so important. So we have these subject experts that can come in and say, yo, we're good at this, but we also need you guys and other pieces of support. Yes, reentry is Dom's thing. Absolutely. But every one of you guys on this phone call come from other organizations that can help what he's doing by being able to holistically serve that customer. And if we know directly how we can connect with those individuals, that's how we get the win. So many people still, and I don't know how we got away from outcomes a long time ago, but then now we're back at some stage of mind where outcomes are so important outcomes are garbage without impact and without change. We can go as many outcomes as we want to, but if there's no change in the outcomes that we keep talking about every year in our quarterly report saying we're doing great things, but we see the same people, Sherry may not see them, but we see them. I may not see them, but Leslie's seeing them. Then what exactly were those outcomes for outside of metrics for people that aren't even invested in our community to look at because it helps them feel good with a nice cool pat on the back. So I think as we go forward, just as Dom said, we have to start collaborating more and more. Most of us don't think that we bring something to the table. Well, if we keep sitting back and assuming that we can't be a part of this, then of course, we ain't never going to figure out who's eating and sitting at the table when we talk about the chain. So new equation, outcomes plus outputs plus impact equals change. If you don't have change at the end of your equation, regardless of your report, go back and do the math because the math is not mathing. And if we are seeing the same 100 people every year, what is the point of us doing this work, especially doing it collectively? Most of us have problems because most of us get in our own way because we want that weird prideful thing of saying, we did that. Ah, technically you didn't. You did it momentarily, but it's not sustainable. So let's stop talking about it and patting ourselves on the back for the one thing that we thought we did great. And let's start making change so we can have different conversations next year, not the same ones. My bad. I was quiet for a minute, so I had to just go off on a tangent. Three weeks can cause that to happen. I told you the heat didn't get into me. I get mad sometimes, man. But I'm going to let y'all do y'all thing now. And just so you know, I elevated what Kelly was thinking about. Oh, yeah, that's back, back at you. Okay. Okay, Kelly. Kelly, go ahead and um, round us out or in, in see if there's any more questions or conversation around this amazing presentation that um, I want to say that Brian, Sherry, and Dominique um, brought it. I have not had the pleasure of speaking with you, Brian, but you, you definitely brought it in today. Uh, Sherry always brings it. She's she's like a walk, just 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 she's about to set the bomb off on every moment. And Dominique, I just get excited every time I get to work or see your work happening. So it's just wonderful to see from the time we first met you um, in that first initial meeting to seeing the evolution and the partnership and the connections happening now. 
And um, so Kelly, what do you have before we go ahead and transition to any last comments for the good of the order before we close out our day? Man, thank you all for this amazing conversation. I know this is work that we've uh, passionately been doing for quite some time, kind of sometimes on the on the back in those backdoor meetings and stuff, trying to figure out what this what this whole ecosystem looks like. So we just look forward to, um, you know, continuing to grow this. Hopefully somebody on here is going to be like, I know how to do a listserv. And I'll be like, that's what's up. <laughs> but if not, we'll figure that out. But I'd love to keep this conversation. Um, just keep it going. Uh, we are building a reentry design team through WorkSource. Anybody is free to join that. We're looking for organizations who have um, interest, not only interest in reentry, but you have specific programs because, again, we can't map it out if we don't know what's out there. We do want to find the experts and everything, and we obviously need to identify the gaps and certainly get into those jail systems more. But thank you all again. You have been fantastic. Brian, I can't wait to meet you in person once again. Dom and Sherry, my BFFs, always. Um, Tamar, I think we have one last thing for the group we wanted to throw out there. Um, is it is it fun time, Shelly? We're going to do fun time. Yes, go ahead and do fun time, and then we'll close it out. Yay, fun time. Muted. You're muted. You're muted. Don't talk about it when you're muted. <laughs> it's not working? What's the date? Just throw the date in the chat. And I'll talk about it. So uh, we've been talking about for quite some time about doing something fun with the task force. It, the summertime is upon us and many of us love the water. So we are going to do, uh, we're going to go to Fall City Float, which is floating down Snoqualmie River. We're looking at doing that. Okay, just shake your head. Yes or no tomorrow. August 10th. August 10th. That's right. August 10th at 11 noon 11 all right august 10th at 11 um we can send out the link for fall city float you can get your tickets and go float with us they do provide transportation you can rent your float they have life jackets whatever you want to do you can bring your own and still provide transportation it is fairly inexpensive i believe it's only like 40 dollars a person or something like that don't quote me on that that's with the rental um, so we will be floating August 10th at 11 a.m. If you can't get in on the 11 a.m., if the tickets sell out, 10.45, 11.30 is fine. We're all just going to meet down there. It's a big river um, and have a really good time. So we'll send, look for that information from Chloe. But if you've ever floated with our group before, it is quite an amazing time. I think we've had like 35, 40 people all float together at the same time last summer. So Come and join us. That is our task force outing. Get to know each other. Have some fun. Let our minds go. Excited to see y'all. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, we're giving you back 18 minutes of your time. I appreciate you all. Please email us to come and join us on August 24th. Say hi, Kennedy. And we'll see y'all later. All right. See y'all later. Have a great weekend. Have a great week. All right. Bye, everybody.